Live from New York, it's The Cube, covering Big Data NYC 2015. Brought to you by Hortonworks, IBM, EMC, and Pivotal. Good afternoon, everyone. We're back at Pillars 37 in New York City, uh, running Big Data New York City in conjunction with Strata Fall 2015. And I'm here with Rajiv Madhavan, founding investor and chairman of Robin Systems, as well as Premal Bluk, um, CEO, and uh, we're happy to have them on the show. Um, guys, why don't you tell us uh, for the um, for our audience who may not be uh, familiar with you, um, what are the what's the what's the problem set that uh, Robin System addresses? What what's the pain point that customers have today with uh, standing up big data infrastructure? So we are a data infrastructure company, and the reason why we started Robin was that we looked at the IT infrastructure out there and realized that this was all designed for legacy monolithic applications, and today's distributed applications really require something different. And the pain that we are trying to solve is that because of the infrastructure gaps, today we have data sprawl, cluster sprawl, so a lot of data duplication, uh, data pipelining, uh, need for physical dedicated clusters, which is creating uh, problems with agility. People cannot get their applications up and running quickly. It takes them weeks, uh, months sometimes to get uh, new applications, new hardware added to their IT farms. Um, the cost, people are not able to keep up with the rising uh, IT investment costs to keep up with the data demands. And doing all of, solving all these problems without compromising on performance is really what we're all about. Okay, so, so take us one level further because for the most uninformed of us, we'd be thinking, okay, so that's, um, perhaps a deployment problem, or you might use a, a virtual machine which actually carves up one machine into many machines. Yeah. And uh, at one point, um, uh, VMware talked about provisioning yeah. Hadoop clusters with, with uh, virtual machines. Um, help us understand this approach in relation first yeah. to that approach. So let me, let me kind of take that question here, George. Thanks uh, for having us. But if you look at the tenants of virtualization, when VMware came into the picture, the whole idea was it was one application, say a Windows application, and you make the server look like four Windows applications, right? That's what virtualization achieved. People have then taken that virtualization into hybrid converged infrastructure and taken applications like VDI, which requires six or virtual seven desktop virtual infrastructure. desktop uh, infrastructure, where you need six to 10 of these servers that you need to virtualize. That was all fine when your application stood up on six nodes. But today you have hundreds and thousands of nodes and you have to get down to process level cluster formation. It cannot be this whole hyper-converged device where compute and storage is tied together because what happens in a big data environment is your data may be exceeding in storage, may not be exceeding in compute. It may be exceeding in compute, but it may not be exceeding in storage. So how do you put together a virtual infrastructure with containers, which is what we have chosen in our solution, for example, where what we have done is essentially storing it only once, but allowing multiple virtual views to be done using containers. Okay, you've said some very interesting things there. Yeah. One of the tenets of big data in Hadoop is put uh, compute and data together because it's expensive to move yeah. data in uh, terms of data gravity. That's and right. Because of IO throughput limitations. That's right. Now you've talked about, what, at least as I've heard you just say, you in some way separate either physically or virtually compute and storage so that you have more flexibility in creating the infrastructure and I assume in, in this case we're talking about clusters that's right. So this makes it easier to stand up clusters. So we're decoupling compute and storage. In the traditional world of Hadoop, for example, as in a big data, uh, you know, one of the examples, it does not, it applies to multiple of these application uh, scenarios in any analytical applications. The data and compute are in one place. Robin's belief is to take compute to where data is not stored, 
but where data is cached. So we have a pool where everything is stored. But in the host layer, we move it to a place where it's cached, the data that is currently being used. So we have a host layer, and we have an application layer in the storage pool which inherently means you get the best of two worlds. Best of the cost advantage because you can use the lowest cost scenarios to store your, your data in, and the highest performance because you can take the SSD and RAM on the host site and get higher performance. So technically we have cut the umbilical cord between that compute and storage. Would it be fair to say that essentially um, by caching the data uh, from the storage layer on the compute layer, you're creating ephemeral, ephemeral storage, which some of the uh, solutions that put um, Hadoop on, on Amazon, for instance, might do, where they might make use of uh, memory and, and uh, SSD. Um, only, um, how do you decide what's the hot data that needs to be stored, and what's the cold data that can remain on the storage tier? Yeah. So there are, there are a couple of things you need to solve in order to solve this problem. First of all, figuring out what stays in the hot layer and what's cold, so that's one. Second, even if you solve that problem, I think one fundamental issue with Hadoop, and particularly this applies when you start adding more applications, is that you end up copying data specific to each cluster. So each Hadoop uh, cluster has a data silo. It is not sharing data among different Hadoop clusters or among different applications. So what we are really creating is creating a data lake from where the, there is a single source of truth and then giving all the different applications a view into that data, a virtual view into that data. So that really allows you to eliminate all of the data duplication and the, uh, the pressure that you put on the network is a disk IOs. So now when you're trying to get the data, that's where the caching comes in. And so that's, it's really, you can't really solve one problem by itself. You can just do caching with a very high, hot tier, expensive tier, but it would, it would almost be like a dumb caching that an exactly. operating system that's right. would do. So that's really, right. there are three things. It would be a very intelligent caching, okay. intelligent okay. cluster generation. Okay. And I think we are, we are trying to solve three things together, performance, cost, and agility. And so there are people who can solve any one of these problems by itself. You can be very agile, quickly provision things, but not really address the storage side issues. You can be low cost, pull a lot of data with cheap devices, but then have performance hit. Or you can have a really hot tier and blow up your budget. So, and you can't really slap these three individual solutions together to get everything. And that's where re you have to rethink the whole infrastructure to put together a fundamental new solution that covers all of these things simultaneously. Okay. So be because we have this host side caching layer, and we can, you can write a rule in our system saying anything that's older than six months, it automatically will move it to the lower cost. It could be a Ceph in a hybrid cloud infrastructure that you're using. So the data does not even have to be on your premise. It can be on-prem, can be off-prem in a hybrid cloud infrastructure environment. We would let you tier it across the hot layer to the cold layer to the warm tier. Different tiers can be created and automatically managed by the system. Just to be down in the in the weeds a bit. Are you are you doing this based on time to live, or are you making some more intelligent decisions about what's hot and what's not? So it's time to live is, is a rule you can override what we do intelligently in our yeah. system. So okay. what we have is we know the um, the viewing patterns. So we basically are using our own analytics and uh, to determine what the patterns of usage of this data is, and based on that, making it available uh, as well in the system. Right? Okay. So now you can override that with writing your own rules which specifically says, no, this one I want to be using that particular infrastructure. Let me go back now to the storage layer, the base yeah. storage layer that's shared, it sounds like, across clusters or virtual clusters if uh, necessary. Um, so is this like a, a single namespace? And then um, does that mean you can use something other than the three-way replication that is native to Hadoop? That's, that's, that's a good point. It is indeed virtualizing the entire storage and data with single namespace. We have a different way of implementing redundancy compared to Hadoop, so we are much more efficient with it. Instead of three-way, we can cut that down by a factor of two. And I think this, this is some of the key features in our solution in how we virtualize not just the storage, but also the data uh, across all applications. And it's just not Hadoop. We could have any file systems underneath our system, we can provide you a simple RAID 6 with erasure coding across this virtual pool of storage that you have defined, right? So you do the redundancy the way sort of high-end 
uh, storage systems exactly. used to That do is it. correct. It is, it is more like what EMC does in storage on the high-end appliances, applied to enterprise applications for big data analytical applications. Okay, so, all right, then I think I'm with you on, on, on that storage layer. Now, and, and I know the, um, I, th I think I understand the, the intelligent cache. Now, was the, was the third layer the application itself? The, the third layer is basically you take an existing application and you provide an image, it could be a Docker image, we fully support Docker or Alexi, it does not really matter. And then there's a cluster orchestration capability. So you can essentially have these rules saying, I want to now create a new cluster with two terabytes, et cetera, et cetera, in storage. Or you can leave the system to make intelligent choices for you as and when required, right? So it's, it's a much more of a completely intelligent platform that we are, we are building, where it can span not just your local enterprise level cloud infrastructure, but your hybrid cloud infrastructure across multiple racks and, and tiers of rack, right? Okay, but hybrid in this case, you, you mean it's uh, virtual clusters uh, on a common physical infrastructure. You don't mean partly private cloud and no, I, partly I, I, public? No, I actually mean partly private, partly hybrid. Because okay. the beauty is this, right? We are not moving the entire data. We are only the moving the data that's currently under compute into a cache layer. Okay. Hence, we can actually have the data sprawl be prevented and data can be stored in a single virtual storage pool and have only the data that's currently being used being moved into a host tier. So, f from a chief data officer's point mm -hmm. of view, this is very important because their, their worst fear is duplication of data. Because then they have that exactly. whole problem yeah. of trust. You know, who touched this versus who touched yeah. that. So, you can give them, uh, you can give them sort of a single, a single copy, but that's, uh, redundant, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but not in the replicated redundant uh, sense. And then help me understand the, the scenarios where you might stand up different clusters for different yeah. applications. So let's say you have production <coughs> dev and QA three <coughs> clusters working on the same data. Today, you would have to create three different clusters, three copies of the data, and then they off, uh, go off and running. So that means not just duplication of data from in a capacity hit, but also now you've got a agility issue because now you have to copy data over before you can start a new cluster. This is where what we are doing is a single source of truth. The clusters that we are spinning are only having a virtual window into the data. So therefore now when you start a new cluster, you don't really need to copy all the data over. So that's, it's not just single click provisioning, but it is almost instantaneous provisioning. And that's really the difference between, a lot of people talk about single click. Instantaneous because you don't have to move data. Exactly. That's right. Okay. And, and, and it's also interesting, right? There's a three X so that just Pramal gave in the scenario of QA, DevOps, and production. There's another three X because Hadoop requires a, a three X tripli uh, uh, you know, triplication oh. of data on so top of those, of, right? Instead of nine X. Instead of nine X, you, you basically have one and a half X QA. because of one yeah. X plus half for RAID 6 okay. type of thing. So the amount of storage and compute cost that we can save is, is huge in the system that we're providing. In, in reality, I mean, as Promo pointed out early on, it's not about just agility. It's a combination of can you give the agility in, in split second because the storage is already there to be able to uh, get a new cluster up and running. Can you at the same time improve your performance by two to four X in improvement in, in performance? And can you reduce your cost by two to three X in and cost reduction. And the improved the performance was the cache data. That's the cache data. And the cost? Cost is because A, one, the duplication and triplication and all those oh, things are storage gone. Savings. Storage savings. Yeah. The, the utilization of the compute clusters is much better because we are using container-based technology where every storage container, compute container, and the entire network is put together into a virtual cluster. Okay. So within the same machine, you could have several set of containers which are being put together okay. to form a particular orchestration cluster level that gives you the performance and the, uh, that you need. Are our customers today using this for sort of dev test and um, like pilot? Where, where are they in the maturity, you know, in, the, in their journey towards sort of production applications? So we have three customers. One is a very large retailer with 30 petabytes of data. In that particular case, uh, we are still in the development environment uh, phase of things. We go into production in the next couple of months, which is when we will launch the company. We have another one, which is also a smaller uh, retailer and a banking insurance uh, giant as a third customer, right? 
So we have all of them going into production over the next couple of months here. We would have consumed 60 petabytes of data has gone through our system, so it's not, you know, uh, we're, we've been spending the time, two years of funding, to make the storage platform be very robust. One of the beauties of, of all of this container-based flow that we have put together is the reliability. So for example, even with all this duplication, et cetera, that exists today, when a job dies, for example, let's say a storage hard disk died or a node died, you'll have to restart it, copy the actual data, and restart the job in today's right. uh, a big data kind of environment. In the case of Robin, what ends up happening is each container is, we know the metadata layer of what the stage of that container is. We would just, okay, this container or this from that node died, we would form another container in another node, move the data, and move that particular compute job, and be up and running, but the data is always available. Right. So you, do, you can, there is no stopping the data to okay. get the thing back up and running. You don't lose that 30 minutes, 40 minutes time, or whatever the time you have taken. Your job continues unabated. So this sounds, to, to, to those of us who sort of grew up with this concept um, with VMware, mm -hmm. You know, there at first they made it easy to sort of uh, have uh, maybe a dev and test and a uh, maybe a, a runtime environment on a single workstation, and then they were they were doing dev tests, I guess, for different operating system platforms on a server. Mm. Um, what might this look like in production? Is it that you is that you want to have a greater resource isolation than Yarn might give you, or is it the, um, or is it really you know the shared storage? Um, I guess my question is, sort of, we have resource sharing solutions and orchestration, um, and it's almost like a remedial question. But where do you, sort of, where do they come up short? You know, it, sort of, you've given me an answer, but. Help so, frame it again so, relative to so those. So. George, you could be using Yarn, and we will give Yarn the benefits we are talking about too, by the way. Right. So it's not like we are handicapping Yarn. Yarn may not be able to do some of the things that we are talking about, which is all this uh, sharing of data and the, and the storage value propositions we are providing about. It cannot give you this whole capability of container-based isolation and can being able to run the jobs across multiple of these clusters. It cannot share the data across production, QA, and DevOps kind of structure. We give you all that benefits. We also have an intelligence in the system whereby the orchestration, so you can run, it's always relative. You have, let's say you have 10 jobs running on, on a thousand node cluster, right? And you're going to create different subset of virtual clusters. This job is more important. It needs 30 milliseconds of operation. That job is not as important. You can mention that in our SLA, and we would control the applications as that the network compute and everything is giving it the highest priority to get that performance layer. So I think the way to look at it is there are resource managers out there today, but we still have this problem of low utilization of data centers, and why? Uh, I'm sorry, you have lo this problem uh, of? A low utilization problem with all these big data applications, and you go through the core of it, Managing resources is one thing, but you need to solve the data problem behind it, and that's what, where we really come in. So we can work with any orchestration resource manager at the top level, but behind it, you need a deeper technology than just managing containers and starting off uh, jobs, and I think that's really where we uh, offer a lot more value beyond the existing resource manager. So you can, you can use any existing resource manager in our system, and you would still get the benefits of what we are talking about, right? Because okay. underneath it, the intelligence layer we bring in, of knowing the, the SLA requirements of each of these jobs that you're bringing into a virtual cluster. So one of the problems of adding things into multi-tenancy is if you have now 10 people using a multi-tenancy, you want to ensure certain applications have certain performance levels. We can ensure that. Okay, so the, the like current resource managers are kind of static in the sense that you assign, a, I guess, a certain amount of CPU memory and probably can't isolate a certain amount of I.O. Mm -hmm. But, so maybe CPU memory, yeah. and, and I'm not even sure, I guess storage. So, um, you could have multi-tenancy, but you're gonna, they're gonna step on each other. One, we know there's the duplicated storage. Yeah. yeah. We can't guarantee the I.O., and if there's multi-tenancy, you can, um, you have that problem of uh, not guaranteeing I.O. 
quality of service because they can what sort of step on each other. What would you have one guy who's throwing up 10 applications and screwing up the whole system in, in its entirety? And in fact, if an application was written to assume it's, it's writing to SSD, yeah. so streaming, yeah. Yeah. if two, uh, two programs on the same node start streaming and they get you know, slices of time from a resource exactly. manager like Yarn, then you lose the whole benefit of writing a stream to a solid state that's, disk. That's correct. Right. And I think okay. you also, this is, we have Hadoop, MongoDB, Cassandra, there are multiple applications. I think that's where we provide a layer which allows you to control and isolate access to resource, which is application agnostic. And I think that's where we add value no matter what your top layer is. So George, the yeah. funny thing about Robin is we don't need you to change one line of application code. Even if the application was never written to use SSD, we'll give you a performance on SSD. Okay, that's, so. That's because it hits, we are, we are installed uh, in the system, it hits our metadata layer, we move the data and you're just getting that benefit in terms of how the uh, cluster is set up, right? That's no change in application code, no change in whatever resource manager you're using, whether you're using Yarn or you're using Mesos, you can continue to use Yarn or Mesos. We just add the intelligence and the storage container uh, abstraction to create a virtual cluster in which all of that operates in, them, uh, in a controlled SLA environment. So I guess I'm thinking about this and I'm wondering, you know, it sounds like all the Hadoop distro vendors would be all over this. And yeah. maybe not even just the Hadoop distro vendors, but maybe Databricks or anyone else who's got a, a data intensive compute framework mm -hmm. and needs to you know, run multiple applications that share resources. Um, is that so part of the plan to, you know, once you're in production to show them? So we've already handled uh, you know, three of the distros in Hadoop, already in, in different customer scenarios. We have Databricks that we have obviously supported with Spark in one of our fourth uh, POC that's just commencing. However, and we have joined two of the partnership programs of two of these companies, but the focus has been on the, the three to six customers that we're working with today, right? I mean, over the next few months, uh, we'll be adding the resources to scale it to having more effort right at the source between us working with these partnerships. But I want to emphasize this. This is not a Hadoop solution alone. It can do an OSQL. It can do any application which is distributed. No change in application, no changes in, in terms of the data flow, or the, it, it can be block storage, file storage, or object storage. It could be Ceph for certain clusters. We don't care. We allow you to provide a cloud for distributed stateful applications that gives you the performance objectives that we talked about. So it seems like a fair, <coughs> a fair way to describe this would be we took VMware to VMware and virtual server virtualization to the limits when we were trying to improve the efficiency of single machine applications, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And now where almost all applications are distributed by default, this would be the VMware for that era. For distributed stateful yeah. applications, yeah. we are the VMware of the world. No doubt about that. Okay. That's a, a very powerful value proposition. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Uh, gentlemen, thanks for, for being on. Robin Systems, quite a, quite a story. Um, Rajiv Madhavan, founding investor and chairman, and uh, Premal Booch. CEO, we expect to hear more from you and, and hope to see you uh, at our next show and hear progress with not just uh, the three first production customers, but uh, some many more and uh, big partnerships. Absolutely, yeah. thanks, thanks for having us. This Thank is you George for Gilbert uh, reporting from Big Data New York City. Um, we're at the Pillars 37, uh, right outside Javits Center and Strata uh, Fall 2015. Thanks for joining us. Live from New York, it's theCUBE, covering big data and